I welcome everyone to our Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. And I pray that the study of the word will strengthen everyone and make us to walk in the strength of the Lord and do everything the Lord has ordained for us to do. The Lord bless everyone today in Jesus' name. Let's have a word of prayer before the Bible study. Father, we thank you for gathering us together around your word. And we're asking, O oh Lord, that your spirit will take the word tonight, make it life and spirit to everyone in Jesus' name. And any kind of fear, any kind of intimidation, any kind of problem, opposition, that may be confronting a few of your people. I pray, Lord, you drive them away in Jesus' name. Speak to everyone tonight that it is I be not afraid. And confirm your word in every heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Tonight we're coming to the concluding verses of Mark chapter 6. That means we're looking at Mark chapter 6, verse 45, all through to verse 56. Let's read some of the verses together. In verse 45, Mark chapter 6, And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the sheep, and to go to the other side, before unto Bethsaida. While he sent away the people, and when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even, that is when the evening was come, the sheep was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land, and he saw them toiling in rowing. For the wind was contrary unto them, and about the first watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit, and cried out, for they all saw him, and they were troubled, and immediately he talked with them, and says unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased. The wind must stop. And they were so amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. Verse 56 And whithersoever he entered into villages or cities or country, they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch if it were but the border of his garment. And as many as touched him were made whole. Any amen over there? As we have read the verses that we have heard, you have seen some peculiar, specific things that Christ did. And what he said, actually, Christ proved himself to be unique in power, unique in performance, and unique in operation. That means he did what no other person ever did. That came before him, and he said what no other person ever said that came before him. We must always hold that uniqueness of the Lord in our heart that he can do as he always did what other people have never done 
and that he says what other people have never said. I read it to you just now. He walked on the sea. Nobody ever did that. He turned water into wine. Nobody ever did that before him. He dried up the fruitless tree. Nobody could ever do that before him. He calmed the raging sea and the stormy sea. Nobody had ever done that before him. He multiplied bread to thousands. He healed all that came to him with a word. He raised the dead with the spoken word. He ruled the sea. He ruled the wind. He governed the fish of the sea. Where the fishermen had not found any fish to catch, he said, throw your net there, and he caught multitudes. And when he sent Peter to the seaside, he said, catch that fish, the money from his mouth, you'll use in paying our taxes. That means Christ is distinct. Christ is different. Doing what no other had ever done. He said what no other person had ever said as he walked on the sea. And the disciples saw him being in the night. It wasn't during the day. The first watch of the night. They were afraid because they thought it was a spirit. And he said what no other man has ever said, it is I. Be of good cheer, be not afraid. No man ever spoke like him. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Nobody ever said that. I am the bread of life. Nobody ever said that. He that eateth of me of this bread shall live forever. Nobody ever said that. And nobody ever could say that. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me shall never die. Nobody ever said that. I and my father are one. Nobody ever said that. He that has seen me I've seen the Father. Can you imagine any of the Old Testament men of God, women of God, saying anything like that? He that has seen me has seen the Father. I will rise the third day. He predicted, he prophesied. Yes, they'll take me. Yes, they'll crucify me. And yes, they'll put me to death for a purpose, for the salvation of the world. And then exactly on the third day, day i will rise again nobody ever said that no man ever said what he said no man ever did what he did and that is our savior that is your savior whenever you talk about the savior you talk about power to do all things and everything power was associated with him from his birth, to his life, to his death, to all the miracles that he did, and to all the encounter, interaction with anyone and everyone, power was associated with him. Matthew chapter 28. I read from verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Nobody has ever said that. That was peculiar to him. Christ and power. The Savior and power. Our sanctifier and power. The baptizer and the Holy Ghost and power. Power associated with him in everything he said, in everything he did. Mark chapter 12 I'm reading from verse 24. Mark chapter 12, verse 24. Jesus answering says unto them, Do ye not therefore err? Because ye know not the scriptures, 
neither the power of God. He knew the scriptures. And he knew that the scriptures were to be fulfilled in him. And he knew the scriptures with the power of God. Luke chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 14. Luke chapter 4 verse 14. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And there went out a fame of him throughout all the region round about. Just hold it in your mind. That any time we mention Jesus, power must accompany the mention of his name. His name and power. His authority and power. His prayer and power. His salvation and power. His sanctification and power. His transformation and power. His deeds, his word, his doctrine and power. It tells us in verse 32. In verse 32 of Luke chapter 4, it says, And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. His word was with power. John chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 2. John 17, verse 2. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, whatever the tribe, whatever the nation, whatever the language, the heavenly Father has given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Acts of the Apostles chapter 10. Read him from verse 38. Christ and power. Jesus and power, a savior and power, our sanctifier and power, our substitute and power. The Lord in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection, and in his ongoing ministry, all filled with power. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. With the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. If he lives in your heart, power lives in your heart. If you have invited him as your Savior, your Lord, and he's living with you, and you are living, abiding with him, there will be power in your life. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Of God. Tonight, as we study the verses we have read, Mark chapter 6, verses 45, all through to 56, the message is titled Christ's Prevailing Power and Our Unwavering Faith. Christ's Prevailing Power and Our Unwavering Faith. A sea is full of power, and his name means power, his authority means power, his message communicates power unto us, his ministry makes power to come into our lives. We must have unwavering faith, Christ's prevailing power, and our unwavering faith. James chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 5. James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and upbraided not, upbraided not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering 
If any of you lack salvation, let him ask. If any of you lack holiness, let him ask. If any of you lack love, let him ask. If any of you lack blessing, let him ask. If any of you lack any spiritual gift, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not. It shall be given him. It shall be given unto you. It shall be given unto you. But let him ask him face nothing wavering. Christ's prevailing power and our unwavering faith. As we look at Mark chapter 6 tonight, there are three things we're looking at as we divide the verses. So three parts. Number one, his conquering power over uncommon tempests. His conquering power over uncommon tempests. Number two, our causeless panic with unnecessary torment. The panic, the fear, the fright, the anxiety, the worry that we manifest unnecessarily our causeless panic with unnecessary torment. Number three, the compassionate people with unwavering trust. As they saw him come to their community, they went everywhere bringing people who have needs in their lives, bringing them to Christ. They were compassionate. They were considerate. They were sympathetic. And when they saw Jesus, the solution to every problem, they went forth and brought all the people to him because they had a wavering trust in him. The compassionate people with unwavering trust. Point number one now. Is conquering power over uncommon tempest. Look at verse 45 again. Mark chapter 6, reading from verse 45. And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the sheep and to go to the other side. You may want to underline that in your Bible. To go to the other side. We need to understand and need to remember that whatever Jesus says will come to pass. Heaven and earth may pass away, but his word shall never pass away. And since he said, go to the other side, he went apart to go and pray, I'll meet you on the other side, he must meet you on the other side. Nothing will cut short a journey before you get to the other side. Nothing will destroy your life before you get to the other side. Always hold his word in mind. He said, go to the other side before unto Beth Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. That's the Son of God, our Lord and Savior. He has left a perfect example for us. Live a life of prayer. Before service, pray. After the service, pray. Before duty, pray. After the duty, pray. Before any performance, pray. After that performance, pray. Verse 47. And when evening was come, the sheep was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. But please remember, the wind contrary is not going to take anything away from their life. They must still get to the other side. I must still get to the other side. And about the fourth watch of the night, 
that's between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. early in the morning. He comes unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. And when they saw him, it says, walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit, and they cried out. But he conquered the tempest, he conquered the storm, he walked on the stormy sea, his conquering power over uncommon tempests. We see three things there. Number one is personal prayer. His personal prayer. He depended so much upon the Father. He depended so much upon God. He prayed all the time. His personal prayer. Number two, we see his prevailing power over the sea, over the storm, over any challenge and every challenge. His prevailing power. Number three, our promised privilege. Our promised privilege. Look at number one there. That is his personal prayer. We're reading here from verse 46. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. That was a lifeline. That was the reason and the basis and the foundation of his constant power. He prayed. He prayed. Tells us in Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Mark chapter 1, verse 35. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place where he could have quietness, where he could pray and talk to the Father without any distraction. He departed into a solitary place and there prayed. And there prayed his personal prayer. And that's an example for you and for me that our lives should be marked with praying. Praying every time. Praying without ceasing. Praying with faith, with a wavering faith. Never allowing any day to pass without waiting upon the Lord and praying. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 1. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray like he did. Always to pray like they saw him always praying, and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city. And she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, for a time, for a season, but afterward, he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by a continual coming she weary me. Here the Lord told this parable to make us understand importunity in prayer is important. Constancy in prayer is important. Continuity in prayer is important. We shouldn't um, miss our privilege of praying. Thinking, I've asked, I've not received, ask again. I've demanded, I've not got, demand it again. I held on to the promises I didn't receive, keep on holding to the promise. And the Lord said in verse 6 here, watch, the unjust judge says, And shall not God avenge 
his own elect, which cry day and night, which pray day and night, which intercede, pray day and night before him, though he bear long of them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. He will avenge them speedily. The Lord will answer your prayer in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 21, verse 36. Luke chapter 21, verse 36. Watch it therefore and pray always. Don't just pray occasionally. When the water is almost drowning you, don't just pray once in a while. When it appears you are driven to the wall, always, when you are happy, pray, thank him. When it's a challenge, pray and demand solution and answer from him. When there is any problem, pray. He has solution to every problem. Watch ye therefore, and pray always that she may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Pray always, pray daily, pray without ceasing. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. If you could convert part of the time you spend in just talking and talking and talking to your neighbors, convert part of the time to praying. Convert part of the time you spend in useless, careless talk. Convert that time to praying. Convert part of the time that is wasted on things that are not profitable to our lives. Convert part of that time to pray. Your life will take on a new splendor, a new power, a new breakthrough. In Jesus' name, I pray we'll be doers of the word and we'll pray more than ever before in Jesus' name. The second thing here is this prevailing inner power. We're coming to Mark chapter 6, verse 47. His prevailing inner power. And when evening was come, the sheep was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling in rowing. For the wind was contrary unto them. When the wind is contrary unto you, don't look at the wind. Look at your Christ. Look at your Savior. He will uphold you. He will strengthen you. He will carry you through in Jesus' name. Our problem is we look too much to the wind, at the wind. Too much at the contrary circumstances, too much at the frowning face of an opposer. We look too much at the circumstances around us. The wind was contrary unto them. About the fourth watch of the night, he comes unto them. He wasn't looking at the wind. He wasn't thinking of the wind. The contrary wind was not going to de determine his destiny. The contrary wind was not going to determine his decisions. And then he says, walking upon the sea. You'll walk upon the sea. He that believes on me, the works that I do, he shall do. As he walked on the sea, so will you walk on your stormy sea. And would have passed them by. Then, if you look at Psalm 93, I'm looking at Psalm 93, and we're reading from verse 3. Psalm 93, verse 3. 
the floods have lifted up O oh Lord the floods have lifted up their voice the floods lift up their voice the Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters you didn't hear that one the Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters yea than the mighty waters of the sea the Lord will see you through Psalm 104 we're looking at verse 3 Psalm 104 verse 3 who lays the beams of his chambers in the waters who makes the clouds his chariot who walks upon the wings of the wind that's our god that's our savior that's our lord he walks upon the wings of the wind and he tells us if we will pray answers will come miracle will come that's a privilege our promised privilege our promised privilege jesus walked on the storm you will walk on the storm supply whatever storm is raging at this time as we follow jesus and we look unto jesus the author and the finisher of our faith will walk through the contrary wind will get to the other side Matthew chapter 14 in Matthew chapter 14 our promised privilege and straightway verse 27 Jesus spake unto them saying be of good cheer it is high be not afraid and Peter answered him and said Lord if it be thou if that's you my savior lord if it be thou if that's you my perfect example lord if it be thou my master my king my lord lord if it be thou bid me come unto thee on the water bid me come unto thee on the water you will do it I said you will do it contrary wind bad situation stormy sea or tempest you will ride on that tempest and you will make progress through that tempest in Jesus name bid me come unto thee on the water and he said don't come and he said he didn't say, Peter, that's too pushful, don't come. Peter, that's looking too high, don't come. Peter, don't think you can do everything I do, don't come. You're welcome. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the sheep, tell me, tell me, tell me out aloud, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. The Lord will calm your storm. Psalm 107. I'm reading from verse 27. Psalm 107. Verse 27. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and at the weed's end then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble and he bringeth them out of their distresses bringeth them out of their distresses he maketh the storm a calm I'm going to read that again he maketh your storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still 
then are they glad because they be quiet that tempest of a camp in your life so he brings them unto their desired heaven he brings them unto their desired heaven from tonight you are entering your place of quiet and rest in jesus name point number two now our costless panic ways unnecessary torment we're coming to mark chapter six mark chapter six i'm reading from verse 49 mark chapter 6 verse 49 but when they saw him walking upon the sea they supposed it had been a spirit they supposed it had been a spirit many times we get into trouble because of our supposition i see that a person and I look at his posture, I look at his body language, and because of my supposition, I make a conclusion, and it's the conclusion that troubles me, it's not the person, it's not his body language, it's not what he does, it's your own interpretation, your own supposition. They supposed it had been a spirit. We we'll see a situation in our lives, I will see something happening, and we do not know this is the Lord Himself, and we suppose this must be Satan. We suppose it's an evil spirit. We suppose it's an enemy. And because of our supposition, we're troubled, and then we begin to cry. We even lose our appetite, and we go on compulsory fasting. Because they supposed it had been a spirit they cried out for they all saw him and they were troubled they saw loving jesus and they were troubled they saw their own savior and they were troubled they saw their friend and they were troubled and they saw the one that the father sent to them to take them to the other side and to take them to heaven and they were troubled he wasn't the cause of their trouble their supposition was the cause of their trouble how many times in our lives as we look at things happening and we look at actions and activities of people and then we think we suppose that this is what is going on then we become afraid your fears will be cancelled in jesus name but you all saw him and they were afraid and immediately talked with them and says unto them be of good cheer change your mind change your thinking turn away from that supposition be of good cheer it is i be not afraid it is i be not afraid have you heard i said did you hear you will not be afraid in jesus name we're looking at first john chapter 4 i'm reading from verse 18 first john chapter 4 verse 18 there is no fear in love but perfect love casts out fear christ loved them perfectly that's why he came to save them god loves them perfectly that's why he sent his only begotten son to save them and God loves us perfectly with an everlasting love. That's why He has sent His Son to us. He has sent His Holy Spirit to us. He has sent the Word unto us. Be of good cheer. Be not afraid. Because fear 
has torment. He that, is, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. I said this point is our causeless panic. The panic that ought not to be. The fear that ought not to be. Our causeless panic and unnecessary fear. We're looking at Psalm 53. And I'm reading from verse 5. Psalm 53. We're reading from verse 5. It says, There were they in great fear where no fear was. No reason for the fear, no root for the fear, and no consequence even of the fear where no fear was. There were they in great fear. Let me show you some illustrations. We're looking at Second Kings chapter 6. Second Kings chapter 6. In great fear when the fear is unnecessary. In great fear when the fear is costless. In Second Kings chapter 6, reading from verse 14. Second Kings chapter 6, verse 14. Therefore, sent ye hither, thither, horses and chariots, and a great host, and they came by night, and they compassed the city about. That's the king of Syria sending chariots, horses, soldiers around the city where Elisha was. He did that by night, and so when they woke up in the morning, they were already on attention there. Verse 15. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And he and his servant said, Alas, my master, how shall we do? Panic. Fear. Torment because of what he saw, the Lord will open our eyes. Verse 16 And he answered, Fear not. Elisha saw what he didn't see, he only saw the physical, he only saw the chariots and the horses coming from the king of Syria. Elisha saw beyond, you will see beyond, you'll see the prince of peace. You see the Prince of Power. You'll see the Lord Jesus Christ. All the costless panic in your life will vanish away in Jesus' name. And he said, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. You believe that? Great I see that is in you than he that is in the world. They that be with us, he that is with you is greater than he that's in the world in Jesus' name. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw, and he saw, I will see. And he saw, I said, I will see. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. All those chariots of, and horses of fire around you, they will not allow the enemy to get near in Jesus' name. Uh, let me show you something very important. Please pay attention. In Deuteronomy chapter 2, Deuteronomy chapter 2, actually Deuteronomy chapter, the whole of Deuteronomy is a repetition of the history of the children of Israel since they came out of Egypt until the time they almost entered into the land of Canaan. And now as Moses rehearsed the history, he gives us revelation 
that if the people who were afraid, if they had heard, they would not have been afraid. Look at this, Deut Deuteronomy chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 8, and I'm reading from verse 9. Chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. It says, and when we passed this past tense, it's, re it's recounting the history of the children of Israel. And when we pass by from our brethren, the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, through the way of the plain from Elam and from Ezion Gaba, we turned and passed by the way of the wilderness of Moab. Think about that. We pass by the way of the wilderness of Moab. Verse 9. And the Lord said unto me, And the Lord said unto me, Distress not the Moabites. Distress not the Moabites. Neither contain for them in battle. Look at Moab. Don't touch them. Don't contend with them. Don't fight them. Don't destroy them. For I will not give thee their land for a possession. Israel, I will give you your own land in another place, land of Canaan. For the Moabites, don't get near them. Don't destroy them. And don't do anything negative to them because I have given I unto the children of Lord for a possession. They were the children of Lord. And I've given them that land. Don't touch their land. Look at verse 19. That same chapter 2. Verse 19. It says, And when thou comest nice, over against the children of Ammon, distress them not, nor meddle with them. For I will not give thee the land of the land of the children of Ammon, any possession, because I have given it unto the children of Lot for, the, for a possession. Moab, and Ammon were children of Lot, and their descendants were the Moabites and the Ammonites. And as the children of Israel were passing through, the Lord said, Don't touch their land, don't distress them, and don't do anything negative to them. I will not give you their land. But now let's see what happened. Numbers chapter 22. What we read in Deuteronomy actually took place before this time. Because as I told you, as a recounting of the history of the children of Israel you have in Deuteronomy. But now, Numbers chapter 22, verse 3. And Moab was so afraid, unnecessary fear. Moab was so, so afraid, terribly afraid. Moab did not know that God had told the children of Israel, don't touch their land, don't fight with them, don't distress them, I've given them their land, I'm not going to give you any possession of their land. Moab was ignorant of that. And because of that ignorance, there was causeless panic, unnecessary fear, unnecessary torment, Verse 3, and Moab was so afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was distressed. His own supposition distressed him. His own assumption distressed him. It wasn't God distressing them, not the children of Israel distressing them. It was what they supposed might happen. It says Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. And Moab said, Unto the elders of Midian, now shall this company lick up all that around about us. No, not at all. They couldn't do that. The Lord had warned Moses 
And I told Moses, and Moses will obey that they shouldn't touch the land of the Moabites. But they said they will lick us up as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was, uh, was king of the Moabites at that time. And he sent messengers, therefore, unto Balaam, the son of Baal, and to Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt. Be behold, they cover the face of the earth. And they abide over against me, against me. They want to fight against me. I can see them preparing. They're going to lick up the land. No, not at all. This is your supposition. Unnecessary panic, cause less panic. Come now, therefore. I pray thee, cause me this people. For they are too mighty for me. By adventure, I shall prevail that we may smite them and I may drive them out of the land. For I what I know that he whom thou blessest is blessed, and he whom thou causest is cursed. You see that? It was unnecessary. And there wasn't anything warranting their calling Balaam your property is secured the Lord is going to protect you and is going to protect your family and is going to protect everything you have we don't need to panic and be afraid if I don't do something now what are you doing something about the Almighty God has already some, done something about that no evil hand will touch you. That's why eventually because of that fear, because of that panic, that's why Balak sent for Balaam because of personal torment, self-imposed torment, self-imposed distress. That's why he sent for them and then Balaam came for the errand. Deuteronomy chapter 23. Deuteronomy 23. I'm reading here from verse 3. An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Why? Because of the unnecessary fear that made them to call Balaam to come and curse the people of God. Unnecessary panic, causeless panic, that led them to confusion, that led them to conflict, that led them to unnecessary fight because of the torment of their supposition. And eventually now the Lord said, because they, I was trying to protect them, defending them. And I told Israel already, don't destroy them, don't touch their land. And they went forth to do what they shouldn't do. And they wanted to destroy Israel while I was protecting them. An Ammonite, a Moabite, shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to the tenth generation. Shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever? Because it's not the will of God. This their own making because they met you not with bread and with water in the way when you came forth out of Egypt and because they hired against thee Balaam. They shouldn't have done that. Nothing to fear. And yet they were unnecessarily afraid and they hired Balaam because of hiring Balaam when they shouldn't have done that, they'll not enter into the congregation of the Lord. They hired Balaam, the son of Baal, of Pesel, of Mesopotamia, to cause thee. Nevertheless, the Lord thy God 
will not hearken unto Balaam. The Lord thy God will not hearken unto Balaam. Because costless shall not come. The yoke costless shall not come. The oppression costless shall not come. Here the children of Israel were going on. And they were not going to touch Moab or Ammon. And they were going to respect their property and their person. They had no intention of doing any evil to them. And therefore there should be no fear. And then they went to pay a large amount of money. They promised they were going to put in the coffers of Balaam just to destroy those people. Nobody will destroy you. Nevertheless, the Lord thy God will not hack in unto Balaam, but the Lord thy God turned, tell me, the Lord thy God, tell me, are you not excited about what the Lord is doing for you? Tell me, turned the curse into a blessing unto thee. Because the Lord thy God loved thee. Amen. I said, Amen. Isaiah chapter 37. I'm reading from verse 6. Isaiah chapter 37, verse 6. And Isaiah said unto them, Thus says, thus shall you say unto your master, Thus says the Lord, Be not afraid of the words, Be not afraid of the words that thou hast heard, Whereof wherewith the servants of the king of Assyria has blasphemed me. Don't be afraid of what you read, of what you hear. Don't be afraid of the rumors. Don't be afraid of the threatenings. God is in control. Our God is in control. The king of Assyria had sent unto this king Ezekiah and I said, don't suppose that any study of the Bible, hearing the promise of God, will save you in this situation. Have you heard what I did to this and did to this and did to that? Surrender. And then I'll take you where I would want to take you. Don't say you are praying. Don't say there's a God anywhere that will deliver you. Otherwise, I will finish you. It's a lie. Nobody will finish you. And so the Lord said unto Hezekiah, Fear not at all. Those words you have heard, in a few hours, everything will be over. And the Lord is telling you tonight, don't be afraid. All those rumors and all those things you have heard, in a few minutes, everything will be over. Look at verse 36. Verse 36, Then the angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, Behold, they were all dead corpses. Why are you afraid of dead corpses? Of people who can do nothing. All those threats will come to naught. Verse 38. In verse 38, and it came to pass as he was worshipping in the house of Nisroch his God that Adramelech and Shereza, his sons, smote him with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Armenia and Ezahadon. His son and his son reigned in his stead. Thank God you have escaped. 
Isaiah chapter 51. I'm reading from verse 7. Isaiah chapter 51, verse 7. Hacking unto me, ye that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law, fear ye not. Fear ye not. Fear ye not the reproach of men, neither be ye afraid of their revilings. Look at verse 12. I, even I, I'm he that comforts you. Who art thou that thou shouldest be afraid of a man, a man that shall die? And of the son of man, which shall be made as grass, and forgettest the Lord thy maker, that has stretched forth the heavens, and laid the foundation of the earth, and has feared continually, feared continually, feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor, as if he were ready to destroy. And where is the fury of the oppressor? Nowhere to be found. The Lord is on your side, and the Lord will help you, and the Lord will protect you. And all those threats will come to nothing in Jesus' name. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1, we're reading from verse 7. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. For God has not given me the spirit of fear. It's a spirit. It's a spirit. And it works on the spirit of man. It works on the mind of man. It works on the heart of man. It weakens you in the inner man. And it gets to the brain. And it gets to the thought. And it is not from God. God has not given you the spirit of fear. Whatever God has not given me, I throw away. I say, whatever God has not given me, I throw away. But he has given us the spirit of power. He has given you the spirit of power. He has given you the spirit of love. You know, fear will make you, will make you stop loving people you ought to love you think he is my problem you think she is my problem you think she is the one not making my business to prosper and instead of loving her loving him you want to do something against her before she destroys me let me destroy her that will not be your lord he has given us a spirit of love and of a sound mind. I will not be afraid. The Lord that destroyed everything and all the spirit that will cause unnecessary fear in your life, in Jesus' name, you will not run from your husband's house because of unnecessary fear. You will not run away from the city because of unnecessary fear. You will not abandon the worship of God because of unnecessary fear. You know what the devil wants to do? He wants to, he wants to detach you from the source of power so that when you are out from the source of power, then he can handle you very well. He brings the fear to make you run. You will not run away from your God. You will not run away from your Redeemer. And no fear will detach you from the Lord in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. For as much then... As the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, 
that through this he might destroy him that had the power of death. That he is the devil. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject unto bondage. You will not be in bondage anymore in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness. Be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Verse 6, everybody, one, two, three, go. Emphasize my, emphasize me. One, two, three, go. And emphasize is at the present moment, today, today, in your present life, he is your helper. Verse 6, 1, 2, 3, go. The Lord is your helper. The Lord is your supplier. The Lord is your provider. The Lord is your support. The Lord is your protection. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. It is I be not afraid. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. Fear is cancelled out of your life in Jesus' name. Point number three now, the compassionate people with unwavering trust. Look at chapter 6 of Mark. I'm reading from verse 53. Mark chapter 6, verse 53. And when they had passed over, you see that? They got to the other side eventually. It will happen. I said it will happen. Everything the Lord has said about you will happen. Every promise the Lord has given you will be fulfilled. Every place the Lord has ordained you will get to, you will get there in Jesus' name. And when they had passed over, they came into the land of Genesaret and drew unto the shore. And when they that were come out of the sheep straightway, they knew him. They knew him. They knew him. They knew he has come. And tonight he has come. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I will be in the midst of them. They knew him. The Redeemer has come. They knew him, the Savior has come. They knew him, the healer has come. They knew him, the deliverer has come. They knew him, the one that never lost any battle has come. They knew him, the solution to every problem has come. As you are today, you will know he's there by your side. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And he has given you his name. And whatever you ask in that name tonight, he has done it already. Look at verse 55, and they ran through that whole region round about and began to carry about in beds those that were sick. And where they heard he was, and whithersoever he entered, whithersoever he entered, he has entered our church auditorium. He came here, he got here before you came. He got here before you sat down there and is waiting for you to call upon him. He will do it. 
in your life, I said he will do it. And whithersoever, whithersoever any location, whithersoever any city, whithersoever any village, whithersoever, everywhere we're hearing the word of God now, whithersoever he entered into villages or cities or country, they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch if it were the border of his garment. Look at this. And as many as touched him, and as many as touched him, and as many as touched him, can you touch him today? Will you touch him today? Can the whole church touch him today? Can the incurable touch him today? Can the sick one touch him today? Can the oppressed touch him today? Can the people that have any cause in their lives, can they touch him today? You see, partial, will he answer you? As many as touched him, as many as touched him, as many as touched him, tonight is my night. I will touch him. I will touch him. I will touch him. As many as touched him were made whole. In your spirit, made whole. In your heart, made whole. In your mind, made whole. In your brain, made whole. In your blood system, made you whole. In your body, made whole. In your spiritual life, made whole. Rise up and touch him. Rise up and touch him. As many, as many, as many as touched him were made whole, complete, perfect, healed, delivered, set free. Open your mouth and pray to the Lord today. A wavering faith, a wavering trust, a wavering confidence, a wavering dependence on him. Touch him and be made whole. His Savior, touch him and be saved. His sanctifier, touch him and be sanctified. His deliverer, touch him and be delivered. He's the one that cast out every form of fear. Touch him and be fearless. Fearless in your soul. Fearless in your mind. There is nothing, absolutely nothing to fear. Unnecessary fear. Unwarranted fear. Causeless fear. That the fears away. Are you going to fear a fellow believer? There's nothing to fear in a fellow believer. Are you going to fear an unbeliever? There's nothing to fear in an unbeliever. The Lord has warned them. Don't touch my son. Don't touch my daughter. What if they don't hear? What if they don't know? What if they still go ahead to hire Balaam? He'll turn their curse into blessing. He'll turn their threats into your testimony. He'll turn their evil into your good. Supposition. They supposed it had been a spirit. Supposition. That's what is killing many people. Supposition, supposition. I suppose they hate me. I suppose they are working against me. I suppose they want to torture me. You are torturing yourself. Cast away all that supposition. It is I be not afraid. You will walk on the storms of life. You will trudge upon the enemy. You fly over every mountain 
and you cross every sea. You are coming to the other side. No fear. No panic. No torment. Fear has torment. Stop tormenting yourself. Don't destroy yourself by fear. Don't detach yourself from the Savior because of fear. Fear causes depression. Fear causes panic. Fear causes confusion. Fear causes wrong action. Fear causes running away from your blessing. Supposition. Wrong thinking. Fear. Therefore we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Make sure Jesus is your Savior. If there's sin in your life, confess the sin and forsake. God loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever, that's you, that whosoever, that's you, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Turn away from your sin and turn to the Savior. You are not afraid of Satan thinking it will hold you back. You are not afraid of his spirit thinking it will hold you back. You are not afraid of man thinking any man or woman will hold you back. You are not afraid of Jesus, whether I will receive you or not. Whosoever comes to me, I will in no wise reject. Tell him you accept him as your savior. Tell him you believe he died for you. And he rose again for your justification. Call him your savior. Call him your savior. Call him your savior. And he will say, And whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever, anywhere, anytime. They knew him. It's a savior. And so they brought needy people unto him. Bring yourself to him today, his savior. Bring yourself to him today. It's your justifier. Bring yourself to him today. He'll forgive all your sin. And as many as touched him, as many as believed him, were made whole. They were forgiven. They knew him. We know him as our sanctifier. Come to him. He'll purify you. Come to him. He will sanctify you. Come to him. He'll destroy that Adamic nature. He'll take away the stony heart. And give you a heart of flesh. Come. Tell him. So we may boldly say. The Lord is my sanctifier. And he will sanctify you. Christ and power. Savior and power. Sanctifier and power. Baptized by the Holy Ghost and power. Power is associated with him. With his person. With his name. With his promise. With his action. 
You hear about Christ, you hear about power. And you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you will be witnesses unto him here in our Jerusalem, and then beyond in our Judea, and still further in our Samaria, and in fact on the mission field in the uttermost part of the earth. They knew him as healer, they brought the sick. We know him as savior, will bring the sinners. We know him as sanctifier, and will bring the believers to be sanctified. We know him as a baptizer in the Holy Ghost, and will bring believers to him, sanctified vessels. And he baptizes them in the Holy Ghost, and he fills us with power, and deals us with power, and dows us with power, indwells us by power. Ask him, he'll take the weakness of your life away. Ask him, he'll take the timidity of your life away. He has not given us the spirit of fear. But the spirit of power, the spirit of love, and the spirit of a sound mind. They knew him, so they brought the people unto him. We know him as the captain of our salvation. Come and surrender to the captain. Direct my life. Control my life. Organize my life. Send me forth as my captain. Know him as a captain of your life. Captain of your soul. Know him as a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Bring all needs in your life unto him. The shepherd will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Touch him with unwavering faith. Touch him with undiminished Confidence, touch him. Let nothing come between you and this Christ, the Savior. Nothing between you and this Christ, the healer. Nothing between you and this Christ, our sanctifier. Nothing between you, between you and Christ, the baptizer in the Holy Ghost. Nothing between you and the power of God in man. Touch his power. Touch his virtue. Touch his promise. He has not changed the same yesterday, today, and forever touch him and be made whole in your soul in your spirit in your body every area of your life touch him and be transformed His power remains the same today. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever.
He did what no other man ever did. He said what no other man ever said. Trust him. He cannot fail. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Faithful is he that has called you, who also will do it. Don't go back home the same today. Let all those fears vanish away. Touch him and be made whole. He will not deny you. He will not push you away. All his promises are yes and amen. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will never pass away in your life. His word is sure. Fulfilled. Performed. Confirmed, certain, assured. Trust him unwaveringly. Nothing to ch change your commitment to the Lord. Faith, confidence, trust, no disappointment in his presence. In Jesus' name we pray. An unwavering amen. A confident amen. You will never be the same again. Say this after me. I now boldly say. The Lord is my helper. The Lord is my savior. The Lord is my sanctifier. The Lord is my power. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my supplier. The Lord is my support. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. 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 What neighbors shall do unto me? What sinners can do unto me? What man shall do unto me? What economy shall do unto me? The Lord is your helper. 
you will not fear what man shall do unto you. Are you there? Where are you? Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you because you have revealed your might to us tonight. That Lord, as you have said, go over to the other side. I'll meet you there. I'll be with you there. We'll get to that other side. Everything you have done, you have ordained for us in life. Even before we came into this world And you said we'll get to that side By redemption By salvation By transformation By your mighty power Lord we know assuredly tonight We will get there in Jesus name Every promise you have given us Since we came into the kingdom and every pronouncement you have made since we came into the kingdom to get to the other side, the side of divine appointment. We thank you for the assurance tonight. We're getting to that divine appointment. Nothing will detach us from the fulfillment in Jesus' name. Any storm that arises, is Charles play any storm that arises is camouflage of the evil one is counterfeit it doesn't have any root it doesn't have any calling from heaven and so every storm in every life I cancel you in Jesus name and Lord will see you walking on the storms of our lives and you call us like you call peter come you bid us come we come out of the boat we come out of the fear of man we come out of screaming and crying and we put our feet by faith on every storm in our lives in jesus name Lord, you and us were on the victory side. And as we both walk on the storms of our life, we get back to the boat. There's calmness, there's rest, there's peace in Jesus' name. Peace in your brain. Peace in your mind. Peace in your family. Peace in your profession. Peace at school. Peace at college. Peace in church. A peace in your family. In Jesus' name. And as we come anywhere, everywhere, I will touch you. Healing in the touch. Deliverance in the touch. I want you to picture Jesus in front of you now, touching, touching, touching. Be healed in Jesus' name. And now, everyone that touches us with Christ in us will receive the healing and deliverance as well in Jesus' name. You are blessed, remain blessed. You are delivered, remain delivered. You are healed, remain healed. Goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life in Jesus' name. Anytime there's any challenge at home, at work, Take a little time apart, touch him, call him, everything will be over. Lord, confirm your blessings upon everyone tonight and let everyone go back home with their testimonies in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray.